chapter 19, verse 11, and it reads this way. Go out and stand before me. He's talking to Elijah. God is. And he says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him. And Elijah, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord, look what he says, was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And look what it says. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again. Here's what Elijah says to God. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The reading of the scripture today. Let's go to the Father in prayer if we will. Father, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that it always is to come in here and share your gospel. God, I am, I am nothing but a vessel, but God, pour through your vessel today that the people of God, your people, will hear and hearken to the word of the Lord and be doers, not just hearers. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you, my brother, AJ. So my first point to you today, we talked about exposure is going to be the title of this message, and this will be the finale of Encounter. So I pray that this message will impact you to get you ready for the next coming series. My next coming series, for those that are wondering, is called, and it's, it's, it's you know, you know I'm a wrestler fan, but it's this, the, the, the meaning means something. It's about inner circle. And we're going to talk about what circle we're with, how we need to address the circle we have, and it's going to be simply titled Inner Circle. And so, you know, there's an AEW <laughs> thought process. Nobody knows unless you're a fan. I know, a, you know, Isaiah and Chase are like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, but the inner circle, we're going to, and, Ty, and Tyler, I'm sorry, Tyler, my front row wrestling fans. <laughs> and Addie, she loves wrestling too. She's an avid fan. I'm just joking. I doubt that. Are you? Okay, I was just I'll say, did I just speak that? But anyway, we're going to jump into that. And I'm excited about teaching on that series about our circle because sometimes we forsake. We just think, well, I'm good with these people around me and, or even what we allow in our spirits, uh, what we allow ourselves to read or, or be intertwined with. And so things that we enter into become our circle. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to address that for a few weeks, probably until we move into our new facility. And so, but the first title here, we're going to deal with this and we're going to come to an end of this particular series. And the first point I want to make out on this particular passage here is, are we caught up in our own world? Many of us are caught up in our own world, which makes sense because we all develop life and we do life. So we get caught up what's going on all around us. We're caught up in our world. Sometimes that we don't let anybody in. And sometimes, you know, we all know, well, I got, I got my kids' practices. I, I remember when my kids were little, I had to get Isaiah to baseball practice. I get to get Trinity to softball practice. Then when basketball season came around, well, we got to get Isaiah to basketball. We had to get Trinity to basketball. And then when the fall season came around, well, that was baseball and softball. But in the spring, Isaiah's soccer and Trinity was doing some travel and they made her practice on basketball. And it was during the fall season. So we were always going. So our cycle of life, me and Jessica easily got caught up in our own world, that we would forsake certain things that we probably should have been doing. Maybe we were forsaking fellowshipping with others, uh, uh, developing discipleship programs with others, because we were so caught up in our own world. Many of us can say and go, yeah, that's me too. I've been there. I'm there now. Uh, and so we don't realize it, but we get caught up in our world. And so it's so easy to get caught up in our own mess at times or challenging circumstance that we forget who is in control of everything in our lives. 
Yes, we have free will to make decisions of our own, and God is not withholding us or holding us at gunpoint to force us to do anything. We can all say, yeah, he's not making me do anything. He says, here, I present this to you. Follow my word, obey my commandments, do what I say, and then it's up to us to go, well, do I have time for that? Well, can I make that happen? Should I do this? Well, I need to put my family, they're, they're important. Yes, your family is important. God's given you children. But sometimes we make those as excuses. Sometimes we allow ourselves to be caught up in our own world that we forget that we're supposed to be seeking God daily. In his word, devoted to the word of God to say, Lord, I must see myself in the reflection. God, show me my way. Show me the way. And so we get caught up in our world, and it's easy to do. Can anybody say amen to that? Is it easy to get caught up in your world? Yeah, because guess what? Some of you may have a 12-hour shift, and then you're like, I'm so tired. I don't want to do anything. Or then all of a sudden you're like, well, it's Wednesday, but I just worked 10 hours. It was a hard day at the school. It was a hard day at the office. It was a hard day at the hospital or a hard day at your desk. And all of a sudden you're just like, I just don't even want to come because I'm tired. I just want to take a nap. So we get caught up in our own world. Easy to do. And, and justifying it sometimes, right? Because we have to make rest for ourselves, but yet we sometimes begin to forsake the things that are really important. Reading your scriptures, devoted to prayer, being a disciple of Christ, developing disciples as well. And so we have to make time. So I want to break this down. Everything Elijah was saying to God was technically correct. He, what did he say? He said, I have zealously served God. That's facts. That's 100% true right there. I have zealously served God. He went on to say, Israel has broken their covenant. That's facts. That happened. They were breaking. They were walking away from the ordinance of God that he had developed over time. Israel, and he went on to say, Israel is now even torn down the altars. That's facts. This was happening. They were creating, uh, uh, they began to worship Baal at this time. They were bringing these uh, statues rising up, the pole of, uh, I can't think off the top of my head, Asherah, there we go. The whole pole, and then there was worshiping a, 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 a god named Baal at that time. And this was the children of Israel. And so they were doing this, and what Elijah was saying was technically correct. He was saying these, these were all correct, but here is where Elijah got off. He went on to say, I am the only one left. Who are we listening to is the question I want to ask you now. Who or what? Let me say it that way. Who or what are we listening to? Most of the things that Elijah says was factual, but then we get caught up. We can get so discouraged about what is going on around us that we begin to allow the exposure of our negativity control or even dictate our upcoming events or steps. Let me say it that way. We can become so discouraged about what is going on around us that we begin to allow the exposure of our own negativity to control us or control or dictate our upcoming steps. Well, I'm just upset at the world right now. Everything that's going wrong is going wrong. We said things like this. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Nothing is ever going to change of this situation. We become, we become so caught up in all the negativity or the things that are not happening the way that we want them to happen that we become so negative in our own little world and it begins to control us. Well, what's the point? I, I prayed about it and then nothing happens. I heard one man say, I can't remember the preacher, I think it was David Jeremiah. He made a statement one time. He said, it, women, God hears women's prayers more than men. And I was like, what in the world? Is, where's he going with this? He goes, look in the Bible. God always answered the women's prayers because when they prayed, they didn't stop until the prayer was answered. But with men, we're like, well, God must not want me to go here. I guess I'm just going, we go on. But that was just a funny statement. But it's like, we fall into those boats right there. Why does it matter? We'll say the statement like that. Nothing is ever going to change. And so we get up from where we're at and we begin to just say, well, God must not want me to be here. It's time for me to move on. Well, I guess I'm not going to do that anymore. Or we'll make statements like this. I've tried that before, and it didn't work. So I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. I tried it. Listen, pastor, you're telling me I should pray about it. I've been praying, 
And God's not moving in this situation. This is where we have to stay a little longer. This is where we cannot give up, but we got to be found upon the foundation of the living word and say, God, even though, as Job said, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Listen, sometimes life seems to be hard, and that's when the enemy wants to say, stop praying about that. Give up now. But that's when we're supposed to press further or harder. Let me say it like that. We just don't sit there and do nothing, which brings me to the second point. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, he said to him. This statement came from God. It intrigues me that he makes to Elijah. This is the all-knowing God. Why is it intriguing? It's intriguing because God is all-knowing. He asked, remember, he, I read the scripture that he asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? Did God have amnesia all of a sudden and forget I'm the one that told you to go here and rest? Now it's time to go forward. But no, that's not the case here. He did not have amnesia. But he was, it's a very intriguing inf- uh, question here because God is all-knowing and he knows our thoughts before we think them. Parents are good at that statement. What are you doing Knowing that we already know the answer, it's more of a statement, right? What do you think you're doing? These statements are made not to find out because we don't know, but the why we are in the place that we are found out, found at. Now look, now imagine this. There's times that I caught Isaiah maybe reacting or doing, I'm like, what are you doing? Or why aren't you doing something? I may have told him to clean his room and I find out he never did. Then Trinity's the same way. Trinity got in a habit, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hurry up, I'm not gonna stay on this little tangent. But Trinity would go upstairs and I would walk upstairs into her room because I never went upstairs half the time. And I looked in her room and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I would get disgusted. And I would send her a message and say, that room better be clean before, that's a joke right now. And so it, it, the question is, in this sense, I wanted the answer. What are you doing? Why haven't you cleaned your room? I know the answer, and I want, I want her to respond. So, but the thought process here I want you to see is why would Elijah, or why would God speak to Elijah that way? He said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? The question was, because I don't know why you're here. I want to know. Help me out. Why that you're here. He knew why he was there, but he wanted to know why Elijah was staying in that place. The state of mind that he may have been in. Because he was going on saying, I am the only one left. There's no prophets. They are trying to kill us all. Oh, and I am the only one left. So he was staying in a place. He was of exposure to negativity. Let's go on. First Kings chapter 19. Let's read on. Then the Lord told him, look what God told Elijah. <laughs> this is crazy. Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola, <laughs> to replace you as my prophet. Now, this is a very interesting statement to me. Look what God tells Elijah. After Elijah said, listen, they're killing all the prophets. They're, I am the only one left. They are hunting us down like dogs. They're coming after us. Now, I'm paraphrasing what I could be saying if I was in that boat to God. Lord, they're trying to kill us. I got to hide in this cave. I got to stay hidden because I'm the only one left. And if I die, there's none left. He could have said that. But look what God tells Elijah. Well, here's what I want you to do. Go back the same way you came. This statement seems redundant to the natural mind. Elijah just said, I've done all that I can, and now they are looking to kill me, and you want me to go back the way I came? Have you lost your marbles, God? Did you not hear what I just said? Isn't that God to challenge our finite minds? We think from, our, from a fleshly perspective and not a divine, godly perspective too often. How many can say, I'm guilty of that? When God tells you to do something, we kind of use our finite minds and say, well, hold up. I don't have the finances to do that. Hold on. I physically am not able to do what you're asking me to do. I've got a bad knee. You're wanting me to build an ark? I'm old. You know, just think about God uses the ignorance of some things. Now, this is where it brings me to the next point. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29 reads it this way. Paul says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. 
Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose, listen to this, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no, look what he does. Here's why. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Look what Paul, Paul told the Corinthians in, in the King James Version, we read it this way. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I have King James. We, hear, we say this all the time, uh, but I do. I hear, I hear these particular passages. He uses the ignorance to confound the wise. He uses things that make no sense to the natural finite mind to simply confound us. The word confound here in the Greek is katashuno, which means to put to shame, to embarrass, to confuse, to frustrate, or to baffle. This is deep for me right here. Because when God tells Jalen, I want you to do this, he's trying to baffle our minds. Like, hold up, Jalen's not qualified. He's not capable of doing this. What do you mean, Jalen? Why wouldn't you have called Chase? Or why wouldn't you have called Jerry? Why wouldn't you have called somebody that may be more equipped to do that? But God uses the ignorance to baffle the wise. This is amazing to me. This is just a beautiful thought process. So are we exposing ourselves or our minds to the all-knowing? Are we exposing ourselves or our minds to the all-powerful, everlasting, unstoppable, immovable, never-changing, eternal God? Or are we exposing ourselves or our minds to the always flawing or the always, always failing the flawed, ignorant, selfish, self-centered, controlling flesh. I would say, unfortunately, what I see around the body of Christ is we're doing the latter. We're, we're falling short because we're like, well, I can't do this. My self-centered thought, my selfish desires, my fleshly desires that are controlling me. I'm ignorant in this area. I'm flawed in this area because I am not God. I am not all-knowing. I am not all-powerful. But if God says that I am capable of going to a specific place, then God, use me. God, take me to that place. Like I said, unfortunately, it's the latter for many of us in this room, me included. I'm first one to testify about that. God will say, here's what I want you to do. And I'm like, I don't think I can do that because I look at the flawed individual that I am. I look at the self-centered sometimes that I can be like, God, if I do that, this is going to affect this. But I don't want to affect that part of my life because I'm content. I'm happy. I'm satisfied right here, right where I'm at. But God says, I want to take you out of that place. I want to bring you to a place we can know what God says about a thing, but then we allow our flesh and our emotions to distract us from our purpose or even mission on this earth. You know, I look back and I, I didn't realize she was here. Sister uh, um, Angel is back there. Her and her, her, she's missed her husband for five weeks. We was talking. Her husband, her and Jimmy, have been ministering in Belize and Punta Gorda for how many years now? Sixteen years. And it's not always been good, has it? Probably more bad than good half the time, right? And so there's been challenges. There's been struggles. And sometimes the, the finite mind will begin to say, is this worth it? Should I be doing this? Because what seems to be like all hell is breaking loose against us is happening. How many have fell into that boat? You begin to catch yourself and fall on fire for God and you start walking with the Lord and then all of a sudden trials and tribulations, tests come against you and to try to challenge those areas. Here's what we got to do. We got to know that what God says about a thing and we've got to allow him to move through us. Let's go on. First Corinthians, look what he says. First Corinthians 1 and 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Which brings me to my third point today. God is 
for us. Never get that twisted. Never forget that. Sometimes we can be like, God, do you hear me? God, you know I'm here struggling in this place. But listen, we have to understand that God is always for us. Isaiah just read this particular passage. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 34. What shall we say? What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever, I love that, be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor that God's at God's right hand pleading for us. Listen, the Bible also says there is no condemnation to them that believe. But here's what the enemy wants to do. No, you're still this person. You're still that. You're still the old man. You're still the old woman. But we've got to declare what the word of the Lord <coughs> says about us. Who dare accuses you? Who dare condemns you? Because we are right standing with God. This should energize everyone in this room today. If it doesn't energize anybody else, it's energizing me right now because the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. What's that mean? That means he's going to be deceitful, bring accusations, and say things about you that may have been true, but we can declare what the word of the Lord says, that I am no longer bound by my chains of yesterday, and I'm going to Stop listening to the enemy. That should energize you in your spirit. Listen, you don't want to know why? Because we are in a fixed fight. If we keep ourselves exposed to his word and his presence, then we can say like the writer said, that no weapon formed against me will ever prosper. Why? Because I am his and he is mine. My God, if the enemy comes in and brings accusations against you, begin to declare, don't you know who I am? Satan, I am a child of the living God. No weapon, even though they're formed, it will not prosper. And we can declare, like Paul says, for me to die is Christ, or for me to die is to gain, but for me to live is Christ. So either way, I win. We win. It's a fixed battle. We've already won the battle. So why wouldn't we pursue after him more? We can declare, like the word says, I am the righteousness of God. So now I am right standing with Christ Jesus. We can also declare like the word says, get it in your spirit, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, let that saturate in your spirit that we are not in this thing alone, that the living God is dwelling on the inside of us. And so when... I don't know about you if you may have never had anybody like this, but I had a big brother that would always fight my battles for me. Really, I believe God was showing this to me as a young child. Brian wasn't that Brian, I was Brian's favorite, that he was this, I was his best brother, but he would never, ever let me fight. And I thought I could fight. I wrestled, and I knew I could hurt somebody. And I was like, Brian, let, I remember telling him one time, Brian, let me fight this dude. He goes, heck no, I got you. And he would fight everybody for me. And I'm like, it gave me an understanding that God fights my battles for me. He was showing me even at a young age that I'm not fighting for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is mine. So the spirit of the living God is now dwelling on the inside of you. So when Satan comes in, which he will, the Bible says he will come in like a flood. The Bible also says, but he will raise a standard against it. Ooh, how? Because he dwells with me. He dwells with me. As, as, as Mark's making his way up here to the piano, I'm closing. I thought you were hiding back there. I was like, where's Mark at? Where's Mark? I want to close with you today on this. I don't know where many of you are at right now in your walk or even your pursuit with God. But I do know this. 
that it is dire that we have an encounter with the Almighty God. Listen, I'm not talking to just about a, well, I have an understanding. I have a knowledge-based relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want you to know an intimate relationship with Christ. Here's why. Listen, it is so important to know God on an intimate level. We talked about this a few weeks back, to intimately know God, that when trials and tribulations come your way, that you won't cave in because you know God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. That when somebody dies that's close to you, that you don't have to go, oh God, I'm in shambles. But know that he walks with me and he talks with me. And as the old song says, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tear me there, none other has ever, ever known. Listen, I have peace that makes no sense. Why? Because he dwells within me. I just happen to believe everything in his word is true. I just happen to believe. Call me ignorant. Call me silly. Call me crazy. Call me naive. But I believe God's word that he said, my word will never return void. That means if he said it, he's going to do it. That means if he says, Nathan, you can do this, I have to trust him because my own self says, well, I'm not able. I'm not physically able. I'm not smart enough. I'm not financially wealthy enough. But if God, you said it, then therefore I'll do it. I'll go the extra mile because I'm only on this earth for a minute time. Come on, get this in your spirit today. Because he's almighty God, then we can be transformed and renewed. You know what else? We can be restored and made new. Not just so we can go look at us, we good Christians, but we can be restored and renewed in his image. God said, I created man in my image and likeness. So I want to I want to uh, do it justice, and I want to say, God, you have created me in your image, and let me, let me be who you call me to be. Let me ask you this one more time. Who or what are we exposing ourselves to today? What are we allowing ourselves to hear? What are we allowing ourselves to see? Because some of us can say it like this. I say it this way, and I am done. That we can look in this proverbial mirror we look at our flaws. We look at our lack thereof. But God doesn't look at us like that. Can you? I want you to see this today. He doesn't look at Addie and say, well, yeah, Addie's really not where I want her to be. But he looks at her and he sees my child. He said, that's mine. That is my child. And so when we hurt, guess what? When we hurt, we can literally cast all of our cares before the Lord because the Bible says he cares for you my God whatever you're suffering today whatever you're you're going through today allow him to be exposed in your life they let his exposure be around you we can all talk about, I don't know where anybody's going to eat today but I make this comment before you can go if anybody goes to Puerto Vallarta and you eat those and I may have just got some people hungry but if you go to Puerto Vallarta and you eat that what is that stir fry thing what's it called fajitas you eat those fajitas guess what you're going to leave that place one hour later and somebody's going to go was you at was you at Puerto eating fajitas we know it to be true, right? Go ahead and bake, go ahead and fry some potatoes in the grease tonight when you go home and put some onions in there. You're going to smell like fried potatoes. You are what you're exposed to. Now, that's just an interesting, funny thought. But listen, we should be exposing ourselves to all of Him, not just some. We have to expose our agenda and say, God, this is not about me, this is about you. If I'm not supposed to go here, then I won't go. But if I am, I shall follow you. I shall follow you. So let me ask you this one more time. Are you allowing him to be exposed in your life?
Are you exposing yourself to him? If you will, stand to your feet.